Detta är den ukentliga nyhetssändningen från Europa. Detta är den ukentliga nyhetssändningen från Europa. Every day they used to be Sitting there oh, magic potions It's drawing me friends Stealing his walls Hi, welcome to European News Weekly uh, and this is on behalf of uh, Sean McGee, myself and uh, Jimmy Hagen, uh, my co-host and uh, I would like to uh, just sort of uh, tell you we've got a jam-packed show today with some amazing uh, interviews, uh, some very heartbreaking, uh, shocking. Uh, we, we cover the, the whole gamut. It's mainly about judicial uh, issues around the world um, and in Europe. And uh, we're basically going to uh, present this to you. Um, and um, the first part of the show, we're going to have an exclusive with uh, Christopher Busby. Uh, who's going to be giving us some very interesting information considering the court case he's in. Uh, the second part of the show, we have the nuclear resistors in. Uh, ed an editor, uh, Jack, who will be coming along uh, to tell us all about uh, prisoners uh, who are activists and uh, how they support them. And uh, on the third part of the show, we have some amazing uh, testimony from Emma and Amanda Kelly, uh, the uh, sisters of uh, murdered, allegedly murdered... Um, uh, John Kelly. John, John Kelly, yes, yeah, sorry, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, we also have some testimony from uh, uh, Stephen Manning concerning the uh, the uh, male tampering that he's had. Uh, so totally, uh, the the interview with the Kelly sisters was uh, absolutely moving. Uh, do you agree, Jimmy? Ah, uh, I tell you what, I was tearful uh, through parts of it, and. Uh I don't know, it might come out in, uh, it, 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 when I actually put in my little bit, I think, yeah, I think at one stage I, I got to put in a little bit, and I think, yeah, it, it was uh, it, it was moving, Sean, I have to say. Uh, but uh, we, we've, uh, hopefully, uh, if you listen, you, you'll, you'll certainly pick up uh, their points and uh, their uh, the request for support for their campaign. So, uh, well, basically, uh, hopefully we've, we've helped them to do that at least, huh? Well, it, it, they need a little bit of traction. They, it needs some attention. It, it, it's getting some attention in the doll, as you will point out uh, at the start of the interview. And, and Claire Daly w did bring the matter up in the doll, so we'll be getting to hear about all that, I suppose, in the in the final hour in the Irish segment. So, um, I'm looking forward to listening back to that. I think. Right, we have very little news for the news this week, but I'm just going to. Well, we have write. loads of news, Sean. But I'll tell you what, we haven't got bloody time, and that's just. <laughs> have we got a minute? We got a minute. Do you want to? Do you want to run through your news for a minute or so? Okay, <laughs> I've got one minute's worth of European news. Here we go. So uh, basically, what we've got is we've got the ambassador Chaley, a dozen European countries arming Ukraine now on unian.info. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, peace in our time. Uh, the UK has basically dropped working tax credit uh, threshold to three thousand eight hundred fifty, meaning nobody will be able to accept it because of the rules that are in place. Uh, part three, uh, there's an independent.co.uk article which talks about the uh, um, the six month strike in Ireland where nobody had any banking and everybody did very well. Thank you very much. Uh, and then there's one other little story about Hungary, uh, the uh, Fidesz uh, National Front uh, Party or the right wing party uh, has been seen talking with uh, the Prime Minister of Ireland uh, and there was a report of that in the journal IE but they didn't tell you that the uh, UN Security Service uh, was basically uh, part of the hacking team client renewal release and they uh, have two, their special services national security uh, have an active um, uh, uh, sort of a, uh, relationship with the hacking team client renewal in Italy and so do their intelligence information office and uh, we had another article which was in the journal die talking about leaked email show Irish Defence Forces held talks with the controversial hacking team in Italy so um, there was uh, some uh, nice releases and I thought I'd get those out there 
Um, so I would say also uh, heads up to uh, A.D. Roche, who's 60th birthday yesterday, um, for Chernobyl Children International. Please go over there. They're trying to get uh, um, volunteers to help them with the Belarus uh, uh, projects that they have. Um, so, uh, right, how, how are we doing, Jimmy? Uh, we're not too bad, so I might get to uh, touch a little bit on some of my news. Uh, so we've got sure. secret, secret emails reveal the risk to water in Sussex from fracking was known by officials uh, and uh, the risk that drinking water in Sussex, Sussex could be contaminated by, frac uh, by fracking chemicals was known by the government for, for more than a year ago. Uh, also, inspired by Greece, uh, UK public wants its own austerity referendum uh, by uh, the op-ed uh, journalist uh, uh, Michaela Witten. Uh, and uh, basically, there's a there, there, there's a referendum. Uh, they're calling for a referendum, and you can sign up to a petition over at uh, HTTPS for, uh, colon forward slash forward slash u uh, u dot thirty eight degrees dot org uh, dot uk petitions. And uh, if you look for David dash Cameron dash call dash a dash referendum on further austerity. Basically, you'll find it in Spanish news. Also, like the big fines uh, in coming for people who are going to be taking pictures of policemen doing their job, beating up people on the streets. So, we don't really have time to get into these stories today, unfortunately. And uh, I did pick up on one. Not even the one about Seymour Rocks being uh, cracked down by Facebook or any of those stories. We, can, we can't cover anything, but uh, we have a full story. Uh, we have a full show anyway, which is not so bad. And also uh, a big shout out to the Belgian town of St. Giles, who, is the, who have called their town a TTIP free zone as talks are scheduled uh, to begin right beside their town on the July the 13th. And um, and I think uh, basically I had a story in Finnish schools and we're not even going to get there. That was a very, very interesting story. So that's my European news roundup for this week. And uh, I have to keep it short. So, Sean, um, wh what do you think we should do? Should we just uh, get, o get on ahead with the Chris Busby interview, which was done just uh, within the last hour? Get an update on the on the test veterans. Do you think that would be a good idea? And we might have a minute to spare before we get the extinction report from Kevin Hester for this week. Okay, I think we should go for that. And certainly that uh, this report from Chris is uh, quite interesting. And uh, we did get to talk a little bit about the situation in the UK and what's going on there. So uh, uh, with all the other news that the UK is coming out with, uh, this is a little background story that people are missing. Okay, then. Here we go. Hi, this is uh, European News Weekly, um, uh, the first hour podcast, and we have uh, Chris Busby here. Um, he's uh, just very kindly come along to, to uh, uh, basically answer some inquiries we were having about the ongoing nuclear uh, test veterans case in the UK. Um, he's uh, uh, in a supportive role there uh, for the, uh, uh, the complainants, and um, I would... Uh, basically look at uh, some of the history that Chris has had with this situation that's uh, widely on the internet um, and he's been uh, certainly shall we say um, he's been obstructed and um, he's won a lot of cases uh, from my research and he's uh, basically been obstructed in other cases quite in obvious ways sometimes uh, but that's kind of my impression uh, from the information that's out there and uh, obviously you can go and track down this information yourself uh, avoiding uh, uh, sort of pro-nuke uh, Chris Busby websites. Um, so, uh, Chris, with that, would you like to give us a little update on, on this uh, court case that you're um, uh, a part of, uh, please? Okay. Um, hello, Sean. Um, the thing is uh, that we are, I am representing two, two of the uh, appellants, two of the uh, test veteran, um, and uh, a company called Hogan Lovell International are representing uh, the majority of them. Um, and our case is completely different from the Hogan Lovell case. Our case is essentially the one that was kept out of the earlier um, hearing in 2013 because Hogan Lovell's uh, didn't didn't uh, didn't rely at all on my evidence, and the evidence was not was not was not looked at. And then there was an appeal. And uh, one of the outcomes of the appeal was that it was was that the whole case was uh, remitted back to the first tier for a completely new hearing. So it all has to be heard all over again. So that was the situation in in that in that um, in that upper tier appeal. Um, 
And then at the same time, though, in the upper tier appeal, the, the Ministry of Defence argued that I couldn't be an expert witness because I was an activist. Because under English law, they said that there, there is precedent law to say that people who, like me, can't be experts because they're considered to be biased. So, in other words, if you go out on the internet, like, well, or, or even talk like I'm talking at the moment outside the court, uh, and you say, well, I think this is the case, I think the ICRP risk model is wrong and people are dying and so forth, it means you must be biased. Well, this is what the judge found anyway. Uh, and so when he remitted it to the lower tier, he made directions to the new lower tier, that's the new case we're talking about, in which I wasn't allowed to be an expert witness. Um, so what happened then was that I, I, I stopped being an expert witness and became the representative. So that's like the lawyer, if you like, that argues the case. And I'll ha I would have to bring in different um, expert witnesses. But uh, at the same time, following that, um, my, my colleagues, my legal colleagues, Robbie Manson and Hugo Charlton, uh, argued, they looked at the law and they argued uh, that it was not, that he was not right in law, the judge uh, in, in the upper tier, he was not right in law to direct the lower tier that I can't be an expert, for various technical reasons anyway, but they're clearly quite, quite, quite watertight black letter law reasons. So they persuaded me to take a judicial review. So in, so in other words, we're, we're going to now, we're now going to take a new case about whether the judge had the right to, to direct the lower tier that I could be an, or couldn't be an expert. So we took that. Anyway, normally that's decided within six weeks whether it's okay to take that or not. But this time it went on and on and on and on. But eventually, a few weeks ago, I think now actually two weeks ago, we got the response from the table judge. This is the judge who decides whether the judicial review is allowed to go ahead or not, or just or even be heard. And he argued, uh, he, he, he threw it out. He said it was worthless, that there was no, there was no value to it, whatever. And at the same time, he awarded costs to the Ministry of Defence against me, because I'm taking the case now, of, of 2,750. That was the amount of money they said that they wanted just in order to write to the court and, and say that, they should, that, that the case was, 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 should be thrown out. So in other words, the, the Ministry of Defence lawyers, they sit down and they write down a load of stuff saying Chris Busby's an idiot and he doesn't know how to do anything and blah, blah. And they send it off to the court and, and they argue on the basis of that that the judicial review should be refused. And so, of course, they won. But at the same time, when they sent in this thing, they sent in a bill for 2750 for the cost of sitting down and writing this stuff, which was mostly just copy and paste from previous arguments that they'd put forward before the judge in the upper tier. So I know this This may sound a bit complicated, but anyway, what, what, the, the outcome of it is that, that actually I now have, have, have to pay the costs of the Ministry of Defence. And my, my legal team, they say that this is outrageous and, uh, you know, that, that, that it's punitive and that the idea is that they're just trying to get me. And I'm inclined to think that probably is the case, you know, because, because the, the, the judgment from the upper tier, from the judicial review table judge was really quite... Uh, how shall I say, vicious, I suppose, you know, angry, angry. Anyway, I mean, you can't, you can't actually criticise the judgment because he's the judge, and if you say, oh, well, this is, you know, this is a wrong judgment, and, and you get too upset about it, you know, then you can have even worse things happen to you, because a, a friend of mine, this happened to him when he started talking about judgments, and they found him for contempt of court. So that would be the next thing. So I have to accept the judgment, uh, and I have to accept the fact that I've got to pay £2,750 to the MOD, uh, which I don't have. So I've written to the judge and I've written to the MOD and say, well, you know, I'm an old man and on a, on a, on a government pension of €600 Euros a month, you know, which is barely enough to live on. And this, uh, this whole court case, which I'm sort of funding out of my own pocket insofar as I can, and people, people give, give some bits of money to the low-level radiation campaign, which I take to, to help pay for people, um, is costing a lot of money. So, so the first the first thing that I would say to anybody out there who who is outraged by this, as perhaps they might be, that we could uh, we, we'd be very grateful for any donations, to, uh, which could go to the low-level radiation campaign, um, llrc.org, 
which uh, and if they wrote on the donations you know for the test vet case that that would be that we'd be very grateful about that otherwise i i'm, I'm certainly not going to be able to pay 2750 i don't have it so that's the first thing second thing is what's happening in the main case in the lower tier in the first tier well the first judge uh, uh, judge allison mckenna who's the head of the chambers has suddenly rushed been rushed into hospital so i mean, i must say that i said that this was like the curse of the mummy's tomb you know, we had we had the first judge who who found um, against the appellants in the lower tier. What happened with him? Hugh Stubbs, as he died of pancreatic cancer. So now we have this uh, and have the second judge now, Alison McKenna, who's disappeared into hospital. So they put a temporary judge in, and this temporary judge uh, said that we had to make all sorts of um, attempts to um, to resolve. The, the, the case with the Ministry of Defence before it went towards the main judge, who is a chap called Nicholas Blake. Sir Nicholas Blake. It's quite a big deal. This they're making a big, a big, a big, a big deal out of it. So it's in the High Courts of Justice. The new tribunal contains, you know, is, is chaired by by this High Court judge, uh, and he seems from the internet quite to be quite a good guy. Um, and the uh, and and what we had to do was to get together with the MOD and, and agree on how this is going to go forward. So I met with the MOD and, and Hogan Lovells at Hogan Lovells offices um, and with Andrew Ades, who's, who's also representing one of the appellants on our team. So like, there's a team of me and Andrew Ades really as representing, but I'm the main guy. Um, and uh, the Ministry of Defence said, oh, well, we, we would like you to agree that we all agree an expert witness. Incidentally, one of the expert witnesses is that dreadful woman... Uh, Jerry Thomas. Yes, I MOD, MOD, MOD expert. <laughs> anyway, you know, one has to laugh about this. I should be quite looking forward to interrogating as, as the lawyer, um, Jerry Thomas, who will be in the witness box under oath. So that should be quite entertaining if I make it that far. Because <laughs> um, I have to say that, you know, that it, it's really hotting up. And this, 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 the fact that, they, that this guy has now found me 2,750 and all that is, is clearly a message to me to say they're going to get me. And I did at that time think, I, I think of and a judgment like that, which I, which I consider to be quite punitive and unnecessary, you know, this, 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 mm. this fine, if you like. Um, but then, then, you know, it does seem to me that, that we may be not going to, they're not going to allow us to win. Well, anyway, in the end, I, th I sort of got over that. I got a bit, I got a bit tearful and upset about it all because you know I've been doing this now for such a long time. I, I, the first one of these test vet cases that I won was in 2004 or something, you know, because like, and I've done about five or six since then. And I, and I, I think, I, I think I told you that I won the Mahoney case in in Australia. I can't remember, but anyway, right, that, right, that yeah. was a landmark. Yeah. Yeah. So they've accepted I'm an expert witness and and so forth. But now in English law, I can't be an expert witness here. Okay, so, so we're going ahead with that. Now, Hogan Lovell popped up and they said, well, you know, we can't do this case until May 2016. And the reason they gave was because their QCs, you know, the, the, the guys who actually stand up there on, on their hind legs and, and talk about all of this stuff, apparently they're jolly busy until t May 2016. The judge, the judge themselves, McKenna and, and the new guy, Whiteley, um, they want this to be heard in October, November of this year. And I can certainly get all my ducks in a row by October, November this year. And, look, and I can argue the case myself, of course, with Andrew Ades. So it seems to me, I don't see why on earth Hogan Lovell need to have QCs at all. I mean, they could get up and argue the case themselves. That's not a big deal, really. Well, it, it would seem, you know, if, if you were standing back, you, you might think that the, uh, the fine and uh, the, the sort of uh, the way it's going, it's, it's all delay tactics, uh, worn away tactics. Uh, I have to say, you know, I had a very similar thing uh, with uh, my insurance when it tripled and I had to put out money which was supposed to pay for my tax bill. So it was like it was like there was some serious micromanaging going on with my finances. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And uh, it sounds like they've managed to hit you at a time when your finances are low. So, uh, you know, I would ask people that, uh, you know, this is the kind of thing that does go on in the UK. I, I had to leave the UK because of it. It can, got can, uh, can, a lot worse I, for me. Can I ask Chris again now, because it, it, it was quite complicated, that intro. The two and a half grand, 
What is that fine in relation to again, please, if you wouldn't mind? Well, it's, it's not. It's not a fine. It's it's the costs. It's the costs. So what right. it is is that I, I uh, we make our, our our play for the judicial review. So we write our, our statement of claim, and the claim essentially says that under English law, the apporteur can only find on on um, on issues of fact. If they if they if they if they, if they remit the the uh, the argument to another new tier, then the, then all the, the all the agreement all the findings of fact then have to be transferred to the new lower tier. You see, so that's the law. That's all written down as the law. And and the and, and any and any a judge a, a judicial review has to be on points of law. So I can't I can't go to a judicial review and say, oh boo hoo, this this judge said I can't be an expert witness and I think he was wrong. So I'm not saying that, though, you see. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is that I don't think he had the right to make that decision. Now, this, the new this, lower this tier This is one of the things I was... Decision, but he did. This is exactly okay. what I'm thinking here, Chris, because one, when you were relaying that story, the, the first thing that popped into my head, is the judge putting himself forward as an expert witness, and is he qualified to make a determination that you can't be a, a, an expert witness? Would he put that in writing? No, well, he did, of he course. Did, the, the, did he did, did he? The, 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 the guy in the, in the upper tier, he did do that, but we're not talking about the upper tier. What we're saying is that the guy in the upper tier who put that in writing didn't have the right to do that because it wasn't, it, it wasn't a, he wasn't allowed to make a finding of fact because that, the law didn't allow him to make a finding of fact. That's right, because to be a conflict a of interest, fact, basically. See. Yeah, to be a conflict of interest there, yeah. <laughs> he's supposed to be impartial. Well, anyway, the point about the, the judicial review is that that judge is supposed to just find it on the basis of the law. Now, when we put that case in, what happened was then that the, the Ministry of Defence wrote back and said, oh, we, we object to him taking this judicial review. And the reason we object is because he isn't an expert witness, because he's a, you know, biased and he's, an, you know, an activist and all that stuff. But that was not the point, do you see? Mm -hmm. and, and, but anyway, the, the letter that they wrote saying all that, their, their response to the thing was something which took them, I don't know, they wrote down so many hours to write, to prepare. So they had to sit down and actually write this thing. So they sent in a bill and they said, oh, well, you know, he has to pay the bill for us to do this, this writing. And that's what the, ju the judge has found. The judge has found that, oh yes, sure, the poor old Ministry of Defence had to sit down and write all this stuff about Busby and how he wasn't an expert witness. They didn't write anything about whether the, ju the, uh, the other judge could find on fact or not. They just, they just rehashed all the arguments on whether I was an expert witness or not, which was not, wasn't the point of the judicial review at all. It's completely different. So they've moved so you off contract. They've moved you off point, basically, and uh, you need to get yes. back on point again. Well, I'm not going to take this any further, you know, because if they're out to get me, they're going to get me. We're talking about the law, you know. With the point about the, the lower, the first year tribunal, uh, if, you're a, an, if you're a representative in a tribunal, then, you, then there are no costs awarded, okay? You can do what you like. I mean, of course, if you take your trousers down, then they will find you in contempt of court and they'll, and they'll, throw, they'll, they'll actually fine you then. But so long as you just make your case and so forth... You don't have to. Pay, if you lose it, you don't have to pay the def the defence costs. You don't have to pay the Ministry of Defence costs. Which, thank goodness, because it's probably in the region of several million pounds, mm -hmm. the amount of money that these cases are costing, you know, just for a handful of test veterans. Anyway, so that's the situation. The situation is, I, w I was, I was, costs were awarded against me um, for for the work that was done by the Ministry of Defence in saying that I shouldn't be allowed to take a, tradi a, a judicial review. That's what happened. So that's pretty uh, pretty heavy stuff. It so certainly sounds like there's been block upon block with this one, especially over the last couple of years. It just seems to be a, a never-ending kind yes. of stream of delay and tactics. And well, of course, and you might argue that Hogan Lovell's argument, uh, you know, that their position of ta sending it on for another year is part of the same thing, you know. Or, or, but of course, on the other hand, it might be completely innocent. You know, that no. they might want to have their QCs to give their um, position, you know, to, to make make their make their arguments and you know they don't feel that they want to do it themselves and so since since the QCs are all busy on other cases you know and these guys cost a lot of money QCs and these guys are doing it for nothing apparently sure. so um, they want to they want to leave it off till, till May 2016 but I can get all my expert witnesses and all that in before then I can get my expert I mean I'm going to call uh, Sawada from the, from Japan and also, you see, this is another thing. We're going to have to find the costs there. We're going to have to fly the guy over from Japan um, 
and then there's a Inga Schmitzfeuerhacker. We're going to bring her over from Germany. These, they've all agreed to do this, incidentally, these expert witnesses. So, I mean, basically the MOD are crapping themselves because I've already told them in my initial statement of claim that, that that's what I was going to do. Anyway, so I've, I've, got to, I've got to get this final argument in by the 16th of this month. That's like next week. Yeah. And then we're going to go into the Royal Courts of Justice before the judge, the new judge this is, in the directions hearing, in which I'm going to uh, propose that we split the cases. So, I, so in other words, you know, we do our cases uh, in October, and Hogan Lovells do their cases whenever they like, you know, next year or whenever. Because I mean, because if we win our cases, and I think we will win our cases unless unless it's completely absurd, then um, then Hogan Lovells don't won't have to go into court because if we can show that there's sufficient doubt about the the risk model of the ICRP, then this will reflect upon all of the all of the test vet cases, not just not just ours. And in fact, that's exactly what happened in Australia. So I went in as an expert witness in Australia, and, and the argument there again was that the ICRP risk model couldn't be used for internal exposure to particles. And the judge said, yeah, they said that those guys, they said, that's right. It seems to us that it can't be used for in, internal radiation from particles. And they found for the, um, you know, for the widow, for Mahoney. So, so it's the same. It's exactly the same argument, but in this case, I won't be the expert witness. I'll be cross-examining their expert witnesses. You know, like, you know, Jerry Thomas. Are, are you sure that the ICRP risk model is completely uh, accurate? Is there any doubt, whatever, given all of the evidence from childhood leukemia and nuclear power stations, etc., etc., etc.? You know, what's she going to say? She's going to say yes, no. The ICRP risk model is absolutely, totally copper-bottomed, gold-plated. You know, no possibility of a. Of, of any doubt over its You'll get By the day, as, as more reports come out in scientific journals, we're seeing that the ICRP model is failing in, in many respects, uh, in the real world anyway. Yes, well, I, well the, but I know, but the real world is actually the court, Sean, okay? Because they can sit back, these these people, you know, the, the governments and so forth, and they can say, oh, well, you know, we, re we rely on the ICRP risk model. They can ignore all of the evidence. They can say, oh, well, you know, we're not even going to consider the evidence. The ICRP are jolly nice guys, and we like them. I mean, and that's kind of what they do. But it's quite much more difficult to do that in court, because if you win the case in court, then the next time that you go into court, you know, that, then, you win, then you win that case, because you've got the precedent of the previous case. Now, all the cases I've won in America have been settled, so what happens there is they just say, okay, well, we're going to seal this case, you know, we're going to, we're going to agree that these guys were exposed to radiation and then that's what caused their, their cancer sure. and so forth. Uh, and we're going to give them a huge amount of money. So here's a million dollars to this guy, Jim, for his cancer. Uh, but you're not allowed to say anything about this uh, and, and, the, and the case is sealed. Yeah, well, they did the same thing in the BP Gulf oil spill and we had Charles Diggs on last week talking about that. And we had uh, the same thing in Fukushima. They're, they're doing that to uh, the workers and what have you. We, we strongly suspect. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So, so at the end of the day, it's uh, it seems to and be they a, do it for vaccines as well. You know? Sure, sure. So all these children die of vac vaccinations, or they get autism, or whatever. You know, and they quietly give them a million dollars and then seal the case. But then that stops further cases uh, getting the benefit of the judgment. So that's right. That's right. So, now, so, really, so really, what I'm talking about now, this case in London that that I'm in now, which I I almost walked away from, I have to say, I I got so sort of not depressed, you know, but compressed almost uh, by by the by the amount of you 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 cannot imagine the amount of work that I've put into this over the last few years, you know. If I was charging as much as I can. It was just it was just monstrous, you know. I mean, like it was like monstrous, like weeks and weeks and weeks of continuously arguing and looking through papers and getting, uh, yeah. Anyway, and all my mates are all thoroughly pissed off, you know. The people who are helping me, they they're all they're all on the edge of just walking away from it all, you know, because it's such a nightmare, because it's a war of attrition with these people. It goes on no, forever. It's such a no, stressful is... situation to be in, having to deal with courts and legality. It really is. It's 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 daunting prospect for 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 the ordinary man and woman who's just trying to make their way in life and have to, to, to get that sort of harassment. We're hearing it. It's, it's, it's so apparent. Uh, we're hearing it every week, Sean, aren't we? Yeah, no, yeah, totally. Yeah. I, I have to say, Chris, uh, you know, the, the, uh, to get people, you know, if people are out there listening to this and they're wondering, oh, should I uh, contact the LLRC.org, you know, to give, make a donation towards this? And 
you know, I, I would say to them that, uh, that that from what I know of you and, uh, you know, the, the work that you're doing, uh, that you really do need support. And to, to try and give it a, a bit of perspective here, um, are, are you able to talk about and, and try and let people know just the sort of things that you deal with? Are you able to talk about the case of the missing top secret documents? Oh, yes, you can talk about that. that that's going to come back into the court, that one. Yeah. Um, the, that's right. Well, they pursued us for that document. Um, my, Andrew Aides, when, I, when, I was, when we were taking the case in the upper tier, um, we were leaked this document, or at least we were sent this document, by an Australian veteran who had been involved in, in earlier litigation in Australia, and he got hold of it as a result of that, a, a, a court case before the Australian Royal Commission. Uh, and this document, it gives the concentrations of uranium-234 in the, in the weapons um, enriched uranium, the U what's normally called U-235. Now, the point is that, that one of the, a, ma a major plank of our case is uranium. There's an enormous amount of uh, evidence now that uranium binds to DNA, and because of that, it can't be considered in the same way as, uh, as the ICRP models it. You know? So that, that's a re real core piece, of, because, of course, the bombs are made of uranium, and 99.9% .9 of the mass of the material that fell once the bomb is exploded in, Hirosh in Hiroshima or in Australia or in uh, Christmas Island, it's uranium. But the, the isotope of uranium that's most active is U-234, because U-235 is, is, is separated because it's lighter. And of course, U-234 is, is, goes in with the U-235. U anyway, that's what this document, it gave the concentration of U-234. So, so anyway, Andrew, Andrew gets up to start talking about this in the, in the, in the uh, court, in the Royal Courts of Justice. And the MOD jump up and they say this is a top secret document, you know, we need to have every copy of it and uh, the judge isn't allowed to see it. You know, of course, the judge dropped his piece of paper, you know, like it was red hot. So they collected it all. And then I went off, after this, I went off to France and I got this letter from the Ministry of Defence saying that, that under the Official Secrets Act 1989 or something like that, that you know, I had to, I had to send, give them all the copies of the documents and I had to make sure that I didn't send it to anybody and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I told, I told, I told them I wasn't going to. So then they said that they, so then I heard from Andrew that they told him that I was going to be arrested in France by the French Sûreté. Um, and then he said, you know, if you want to spend Christmas in, in Clink, you better do something. So anyway, I got back to them and I said, oh, all right, okay, well, I burned the document lighting the fire on the boat or something or another. Which, so, so it sort of died down, but that document is still, is still secret, and we're asking the new judge under, dire under, di under the directions to release this document. Not, I mean, the document actually was in court, it turns out. We've done lots of investigations. It had been in court, so in, in effect it was in the public domain. Right. But the MOD are now saying that the Official Secrets Act allowed them retrospectively anyway to say that it's a secret document, even if it was in the public domain. And so we're not allowed to have it. So my argument in, in, the, in the new case, the new first tier, is that we, we have a, a, a request for directions, and I shall take that before the new judge on the 24th, and uh, we shall see then, you know, how the new judge uh, um, assesses it. And if he's a good guy, I think he'll have to say that, well, we need that document because it's essential evidence in this case, and otherwise the, 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 the uh, appellants won't get justice. Uh, after all, you know, we're saying that these people were exposed to radiation from fallout, and yet there are no measurements of fallout that we can trust. They're no, and we're not allowed to see the measurements of fallout that we know they have because they say it's a secret. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, and so you know, it's, it's, it, it, this this particular case that I'm in now is is is, is like t like fighting somebody with all of my limbs tied up. Yeah. Because not only am I not allowed to see secret documents that show that these people were exposed to radiation, but I'm not even allowed to be an expert witness because I'm also somebody who goes out and talks on to on, on programs like yours. And so, you know, you have to ask, well, what on earth can I do? And it could well be that they will say nothing, you know, and that when I get up to say anything at all, the, the MOD will, be, will jump up and say, objection, Dr. Busby's giving evidence. You know, even if I say, like, oh, well, you know, nice day, Your Honor. And they'll say, objection, Dr. Busby's giving evidence. Expert evidence, you see. So, I mean, it's, it's a, it's, I'm in a very, very strange and, and Kafkaesque position and I I'm okay. going to just have to like tiptoe in there to the lion's den and see how it goes 
and of course it could go very badly in which case I, I, I'll just have to you know read a statement and, and walk out I think well, that's the only way there to are it. three points here of course you can always say that Geraldine Thomas has been on TV a hell of a lot more than you have that's number one uh, number two you know for those out there who think oh no this is all conspiracy theory tinfoil hat stuff I refer them to the Guardian uh, being threatened with closure by the UK government for uh, the Snowden affair right and that's well documented and there's uh, videos that you can go and see to catch that up and the fact that they've retroactively made something secret well that's been allowed since the 2014 uh, change in the secrets act um, and so it made everything uh, there's nothing now that is not uh, uh, unsecret or in the public domain everything now is owned by a corporation or something or a business or or a, a department um, so so it's a real close closure on sort of academic freedom of speech um, and that ties into that uh, well that look at what look at what happened to Andrew Wakefield you know I mean the point is, is that these people these are big dogs yeah I mean that that, that autism um, immunization guy I mean he was completely crushed and destroyed yeah uh, and and it's not as if they can't do that you know so I mean and I've often said I mean often often have I said to people do not stand up directly in front of these people or they will crush you. And here I am standing up in front of them in court. I mean, what am I doing? What am I doing? Well, you know, I, I think it, we get the word out and we'll promote you and hopefully people will listen to this podcast and maybe it will encourage them to help towards the cause, help you pay your fine and help you get your costs so you can get the Japanese uh, and other specialists over. So, Well, know, maybe, Sean, yes, maybe was... Sean, it would be a good idea to maybe try and organise a, a, a GoFundMe thing to, to, to help Chris out a little bit in the background uh, because it's, it, the, the, the two and a half grand is in relation to something which may or may not happen after October. Is that correct, Chris? Well, only if they say, only if the MOD say that they're not going to press for it. Right. Okay. I mean, the, judge, judge, the judge has said I've got to pay it, but I'm allowed to write a letter uh, within 14 days, which is like probably, you know, just up now, um, in which I say why I shouldn't pay it or why I can't pay it. And then, of course, that then, then the Ministry of Defence is, is then responds within seven days. Uh, about what they think about my letter saying I don't want to pay it or I can't pay well, it. Well, come here, Chris. Chris. Uh, and then the judge decides that I have to pay it or I don't. Chris, might I suggest in the meantime, instead of saying you won't or will pay it, why don't you sort of like a uh, contract with send them a letter and say, I'll pay on such and such a datum and put it out uh, a year? Uh... I, I don't see the point in that. I want to make. I want to find out whether I, whether I should pay it or not. And the, and the easiest way is to say is to send a letter, which I have done, saying, firstly, I don't think I should pay it because it's unjust and, and punitive. Yeah. Um, and secondly, that I can't pay it anyway because I'm a poor old man on a government pension with with, with no money. You know. So so even mm. if I mean even if it comes to it and they say you've got to pay it. And I say, well, I can't pay it. Well, usually what happens, you know, in those situations is they say, oh, well, you know, what can you pay? And I say, oh, well, twenty pounds a month. So then it, it'll be that kind of, it'll be that kind of. Oh, you'll you know, make make them an official it. offer. That's that's a good idea. And uh, yeah, that's a good idea. Make them an official offer. Good idea. I like yeah, that. I like yeah. that. Because I mean, it's the same in everything. Now, I mean, even yeah. if you can't pay your rent or your gas bill or something like that, you know, nowadays you just say, well, sorry, I can't pay my gas bill. It's too big. And, they'll, and then they say, what they do is say, well, you have to pay it, you know, 20 pounds or whatever you can afford. Exactly, you give them what you can uh, afford, we'll, yes, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And we'll even connect if it's, it even a, if it's a only, yeah. meter. Even if it's only a, a euro or, or, or a quid a week, you know, at least you're, yeah, yeah, you're, sure. you're, you're, yeah. you're showing well, uh, intent, you know, you're showing uh, good intent. Well, that, yeah, of course. Well, I, I mean, I know all about these, the, so I'm, that's what I'm doing. But anyway, we'll see. Yeah. The thing is, if they're out to get me, they'll say, well, stuff you, you know. You, yeah. You, no, no, totally. But but we, we, we can uh, try one avenue and certainly get the word out so that people are aware of your situation. Well, um, well it's not it's not only that, you know, Sean. It's it's actually also the fact that we we need to run this case, you know. Yeah. And, and, I mean, for Andrew to come up from Cornwall, it costs money. He has to drive all the way up there and, you know, we have to pay for him to stay somewhere. And then, you know, poor old Dye's doing all this work for nothing and a huge load of photocopying costs and carting things up and down in taxis and so forth. I mean, that you know there's just an awful lot of it and and then of course you know you've got to fly these experts in you've got to put them up somewhere at a hotel you know and look after them and so forth it's, it's it all costs money and and of course we don't have it we don't have that sort of money and the amazing thing is that the veterans themselves 
I mean, I don't mean our appellants, but I mean the actual British Nuclear Test Veteran Association, those people, they, they've, got, they've got thousands of pounds, no, tens of thousands of pounds, and they, they won't put up a bean. So uh, it's really quite weird, actually. I don't understand why that is, but still, it's how it is. I mean, nobody's got any money for this. Everybody's poor, you know. Sure, sure. All right, well, we'll get this word about. We'll, uh, we'll uh, get this podcast up today and... Then basically, uh, we'll we'll give uh, we'll certainly get the word around all the nuclear sites, anti-nuclear sites, and let them know that uh, that there's problems on you know in the uh, in the UK. Um, we've given them some evidence that uh, shows that that everything you're saying is incredibly plausible. Um, and uh, I think at the end of the day, it's up to up to people to uh, try and help out in whatever way they can. Because uh, but you see, before before an even-handed judge, we can win this case. It, it, it's yeah. a very very simple case to win. Yeah. And uh, I mean, we would have won it in front of Hugh Stubbs, as indeed I did. I won it in front of Hugh Stubbs on five different occasions. Okay, so for individual veterans, yeah. but then we were scuppered. Uh, in the big in the big case, and then Hugh Stubbs wasn't allowed to, you know, was unable to tell us why that happened because he then suddenly died. So this is worth sort of running that through. We're running that again before a new judge, which we hope and we hope this judge will be will be uh, like Hugh Stubbs, will be you know even-handed and and will look fingers at crossed anyway. Um, we we really want to get you back on some of your mobile phone research. We know you've been uh, been uh, sort of working away in the background on that. Um, so, uh, but but thank you so much for uh, coming, Chris. It's uh, it's been really great. Okay. Uh, anything you, you want to say, Jimmy? Yeah. Well, th thanks, Chris, uh, for coming on short notice. Uh, it's great to get an update. I'm just sorry that we don't have a little bit more time, and it couldn't be a bit more relaxed. But uh, we're getting ready for a show in just under 20 minutes, and uh, <laughs> time in, uh, is is of the essence to get this out live. I I think and get. It because we have uh, several interviews to, to, to get out live here. People need to get their stories out. So I hope we'll hear from you soon, Chris, and thanks very much. Right. Okay. See you guys. Bye. God bless and thank you. Um, well, there you go, Sean. That was the, uh, that was the, the, the first part. Of, that was mental, actually, getting that, trying to tie that in so quickly before the show. But uh, fair play to Chris. He's... He, he he's a real warrior, and uh, I have to say I have to, he, I've got maximum respect for Chris. Yeah, I know he's he's definitely one of our uh, biggest uh, fighters. Yeah, so yeah. It's uh, you know, it needs a lot of support, and uh, you know, he, he's definitely proved himself in the past to be uh, you know, to be winning these cases, and he gets so much hassle from the sort of uh, Pentagon crowd, you know. I, he even got uh, he even got uh, one of the Pentagon lot actually contacted uh, the uh, people who are uh, you know who run uh, pe people's internet radio uh, to uh, get him kicked off the radio station because they didn't dare <laughs> yeah. have him speak well, uh, aloud. That'll so, be, that'll uh, be over our dead bodies. What do you reckon, Sean? I think people's internet radio were uh, were the last people to ask to censor something. So fair yeah, play. To yeah, them. yeah, fair play is right. Yeah. Well done, Larry. Well done, Finn. And uh, kudos where it's deserved. So um, we're uh, <laughs> we're on the wire here, and uh, <laughs> so uh, I can't remember how the uh, extinction report was introduced this week. Uh, do you want to maybe just give it a quick little plug there before? Okay. Well. I'll just say basically that uh, we've got Kevin Hesto, the indomitable. He's uh, he's uh, coming from uh, from New Zealand, uh, especially today, all the way from New Zealand uh, to give us the extinction report, uh, our weekly or bi-weekly report, depending on what's going on, uh, with uh, updates on climate change issues um, and reports that are uh, have been around in the last week or so. So uh, uh, let's go straight to that. I'd like to know, oh no, I don't know I'd like to welcome you uh, to the Extinction Report today uh, uh, with uh, Kevin Hester, and uh, we'll just take it straight over to Kevin. Uh, Kevin, tell us uh, what's happening with the uh, climate and, uh, and associated issues, if you don't mind. Yes, good morning from down under, everybody. 
today's extinction report is going to be based on the basic elements of fire and water. We'll start with fire. There's an unprecedented fire season has already started in Alaska and Canada, and it's so far there, it has burnt 11 million acres. It's ex an extraordinary amount of of burning for this time of the, or for any time, but for this time of the year. It's a situation that gained explosive intensity this year as global temperatures hit new new all-time record highs. And there's an obnoxiously persistent ridge in the jet stream that has deli delivered extreme heat to Alaska and West Canada. As of about a week ago, there were 652 fires in Alaska alone. And that burnt an unprecedented 3.5 million acres. 3.4 million acres of that have burnt since June 18th. So in three weeks, we've lost three and a quarter million acres of forest that have been sequestering carbon. So all of that carbon has been readmitted back into the atmosphere and all of the soot from, from those fires has gone up into the stratosphere and is distributed around the northern hemisphere. But a lot of that is landing on the polar ice caps, which lowers the albedo effect, the reflectivity of the ice, and it increases and, and promotes the melt. Across the border from, from Alaska and Canada, there's an, an outrageous 470 wildfires that have put another 6.4 million acres to the flame. It's, um, I think it's about double the five-year average and nearly three times the 25-year average. And this is an important detail to look at. That it, this is the exponential nature of the situation that we're in. It's quite an extraordinary situation. And remarkably, New Zealand has sent firefighters up to Canada to help the Canadians and the Canadian Armed Forces fighting these fires. And this is an important, another important detail is that these countries are really well prepared for fires, but they are seeing, they are seeing a, a level or, or a, a quantity and, and ferocity of fires that they've never seen before, and they're bringing in support from as far away as a place like New Zealand. On top of that, their budgets for firefighting for the year have already been used up. And this is something that we have to consider. We can't just, they, they just can't keep inventing money to fund all this. This is, has a crippling effect on the economies of these countries, just purely and simply from having to pay all the firefighters to fight the fires. But the medical system is becoming overwhelmed because people are developing all sorts of respiratory problems. The people that are most vulnerable are people like asthmatics who already have um, breathing problems. And then any, any person who has any kind of health issue, it becomes much worse because of the fact that the air that they're breathing is so bad and it creates stress. Uh, people have heart attacks. And a lot of the, the people who are suffering the, the secondary effects of these fires aren't listed as as fatalities or victims of the fires. If you've already had a respiratory disease and you go in, it's just another respiratory disease. But the reality is, it's a climate change related illness. Okay, I think we'll, we'll talk now a little bit about the water issue. The Earth's groundwater basins are running out of water pretty much everywhere. One third of the Earth's largest groundwater basins are under threat because humans are draining so much and we're using it really inefficiently. In the old days, and already and still today in Africa, people are carrying water from wells in containers, heavy containers, and they carry them on their heads. When they get home, they are very careful with how they use that water. But when people get it coming out of a tap, and it's been coming out of a tap all their lives. They are wasteful. And we can see this in places like California where they have an incredible drought in California, but all the golf courses are still green. Not quite as green as they used to be, but they're still green. So they're abusing, the, they're abusing this asset of water, and it's a finite asset. And because of the nature of our civilization and the, and the fact that 
we are wastrels with so much of what we do. This water is being wasted. It's not. They're not. They're not being careful with how they use it. They're overstressing the aquifers, and very soon, even in the United States, I believe we will see water wars. But we're already seeing those water wars taking place in the Middle East. The Arabian aquifer system spreads between Yemen and Saudi Arabia, and there are 60 million people that that live off that water. Most people will be aware at the moment that Saudi Arabia is bombing the bejesus out of Yemen. If you, if all, all of these wars that are raging around the world are resource wars. And the predominant one that we're all aware of is the wars for fossil fuels. But more and more now we're seeing wars for water. And I believe that the war against Yemen is a move by Saudi Arabia to control Yemen's oil and water. The Baikal, the Baikal Lake in, in um, I think it's Turkmenistan, is the, it has 20% of the world's fresh water. And it is turning brackish and having lots of ecological problems. And at the moment, the Russians are having a dispute with their neighbours over building dams on, on that, the, the rivers that come out of the Baikal, the Baikal Basin. So we have another possibility of another war starting between Russia and their neighbours over the flow of water out of the, the Baikal Sea. As usual from the Extinction Report, there's no good news. Um, yes, Kevin, so I'd like to uh, just put a heads up to uh, First Nations Say Enough, uh, who are a First Nations uh, Facebook group. Uh, some of their uh, colleagues and themselves have been uh, either evacuated or not, uh, uh, and uh, are, you know obviously have concerns about what's going on there with the with the uh, fires in Saskatchewan. Um, and um, I just uh, thought I'd uh, wish them all the best uh, at this very difficult time. I was also hearing reports that when they when people were being evacuated, like the elders uh, from the tribe, uh, that uh, they weren't being uh, supported with uh, food and blankets. Uh, when they got to evacuation points, uh, although I think uh, there were other First Nations people rallied around with food and, and took them to the, the people, uh, but I just thought I'd mention that. Um, uh, what, what else do you have for us at all, uh, Kevin? A lot of people are putting their faith in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and we're, they're meeting in December at the end of the year, and some people have hope that they're going to come up with some kind of policy that will slow down, mitigate, or stop the catastrophe that we're, we're confronting. I do not believe that for one second. Just recently, uh, Professor Chris Field, who is the founding director of the Carnegie Institution's Department of Global Ecology, and he's a professor of interdisciplinary environmental studies at Stanford University, He's the co-chair of the IPCC's working group number two. And he's the United States nominee for chairman of the IPCC. Now just bear in mind that the United States is virtually both the Republic, well the Republican Party definitely, but the, the Democrats as well. They're virtually climate change deniers. They've only just barely, and only some of them, accepted that climate change is anthropogenic and is happening. Well, this person, Chris Field, who could end up being, in, in a few months, the head of the IPCC, he's just come out and said that 1.5 degrees C above baseline is still feasible. This is complete and utter lies. We're at 0 0.96 C now. And Shell, Shell Petroleum and the International Energy Authority have both conceded that 4C is baked in in the short term and 6C longer term. And the person who's just about to take over the IPCC is still talking about 1.5C. This is a very, very big issue. These people are lying, barefaced lying to the planet. And what... The problem with them lying, you know, we used to being lied to by 
our politicians and, and the people who rule our world. But the trouble with these lines is that we're losing the opportunity, we're missing the opportunity to mitigate and to do to do to take some actions that would slow down this runaway train smash that we're all part of. But having having these people like Chris Field in at the very top of the food chain of the IPCC guarantees Armageddon for our planet. And it guarantees that Paris will fail, just like Copenhagen did, just like all the ones before it. We, we really need, for this planet, we need a planetary-wide Marshall Plan where we throw every resource available to us at this problem. But that isn't going to happen. And, you know, there's the vested interest groups from the fossil fuel industry that are a really classic example of that. There's a, 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 a world expert called uh, Hans-Joachim Schnellhuber who, who's been advising the German government and Pope Francis uh, recently for his um, recent pronunciations on, on global warming and climate change. And he, he has, uh, Schnellhuber has come out and said the only thing that will, will save us at this stage is an induced implosion of the fossil fuel industry an induced implosion. What they mean is that we have to force an implosion of the fossil fuel industry. But you you and I, we all know that the fossil fuel industry has all the money, which they've made, by the way, from incinerating the biosphere, and they're going to throw every single last dollar they have at maintaining their business model. But it's interesting, sometimes you can see in the background where the experts say what has to be done. An induced implosion has to be done of that industry. And who thinks that's going to happen? I certainly don't. As we can see, a US firm has uh, sued Canada uh, for $10.5 billion over uh, water resources. Uh, a company called Sunbelt Sun Water Inc. of California uh, is suing the, uh, is Canada, uh, basically. Uh, the suit is being filed under Chapter 11 of the North American Free Trade Agreement, uh, and that would be uh, NAFTA. Uh, Sunbelt says it has been mistreated by the BC government, and this is kind of sign of TTIP to come. Now, there was a couple of other little stories. Uh, we've got the uh, latest numbers show at least five metres sea level rise locked in by the new scientist, which is kind of pointing uh, to uh, the, the sort of... Uh, scenarios that you were mentioning, Kevin. And then finally, the Antarctic vortex, uh, basically, which we've seen in the Northern Hemisphere reaching down as the, as the uh, cold is being bled into the warmer areas of the South. Uh, we're seeing that in the Antarctic, uh, the Eastern Australia is actually uh, chilled to the bone, uh, to quote a story uh, from the uh, news.com. Um, so would you like to take us into uh, some of the ins and outs of that uh, situation, with the, especially with the polar vortex uh, that we're seeing in the south there, please? This, this new scenario of having a disrupted polar vortex in, in the southern hemisphere is very new and it's very frightening. Last year we watched in the United States with the meandering jet stream and the, and the Gulf Stream slowing down and effectively it did stop for a very brief moment. Paul Beckworth from the University of Ottawa has data on that. But we've, we watched this sweep across the United States where we had those incredible snowstorms that shut down effectively large parts of the United States and everyone was amazed to see that. But now we're seeing similar phenomenon happening in the Southern Hemisphere, and no one expected that, absolutely no one, because we don't have the same level of emissions in the, in the Southern Hemisphere, we don't, and we haven't seen up until this point the same level of heating, but now we're getting this climate disruption that's incredible. About a week ago, we had a minus 20 degrees in Putaki in the South Island of New Zealand, where on the day it was colder, in New Zealand than it was on Mount Everest. And now we have this, this new phenomenon called the Antarctic polar jet stream issues. Robin Westerner on his blog, blog spot, Robin, Robin Westerner blogspot.com, it's called Seymour Rocks, you'll find it easily. He's done a, a post about it and I read it and I was dumbfounded to think that that has come completely and utterly out of the blue. Everyone talks or thinks about Australia as being this huge hot continent and now they're getting blisteringly cold weather events taking place there. 
if that doesn't worry people, you'd, you'd wonder what people were, were smoking. Now, let's get back to the, uh, the, the worst case, uh, the scenario of sea level rising. Think Progress brought out a paper a couple of days ago where they said we're already hitting the worst case scenarios for sea level rises. Recent studies have shown that both the Greenland ice sheet and the West Antarctic ice sheet have seen massive increases in ice loss in just the last five years. The rates of loss far exceed even those imagined a few years ago. This is a very important detail. A few years ago, they made calculations about worst case scenarios and they'd been blown out of the water. There's further evidence that the West Antarctic ice sheet has begun an irreversible process of collapse, in part because it is melting from underneath. So we have this perfect storm of the, the hot air above in the atmosphere above the oceans, and then because the oceans are a battery and absorb most of the heating, the oceans are heating up and the, and the sea ice is being attacked from below and above. At the moment, the Greenland and Arctic ice sheets are contributing less than a millimetre a year to sea level rise, but they have the potential to add 20 feet to 200 feet to ocean levels. And that's depending on whether gas emissions, greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise. Well, A, they are, and B, the clathrate gun has been fired and methane is pouring out of the oceans, which are putting that on, on steroids. Peter Wadham's uh, did a fantastic pres presentation, uh, it's called the FEM lecture, F-E-E-M, on Arctic amplification and climate change and global warming. He brought that out on the 12th of May uh, this year, and you can find that on YouTube. That's a really great uh, presentation. It's a couple of, it's nearly two hours long, but it'll be the best two hours of your life you could spend in learning about this disaster. Uh, yeah, well, thanks a lot, uh, Kevin. That's uh, some amazing uh, download of information, and uh, thanks for your uh, tireless efforts in research. Um, I think we just point out that Exelon uh, this week have been found that uh, they were aware of uh, 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 man-made climate change uh, seven years before everybody else. Uh, Thirty-four years ago, they, they had a report in their hands uh, discussing the, uh, the issues uh, with uh, putting fossil fuels uh, into the atmosphere. Um, and it was uh, basically after seven years, uh, everybody else got to find out about it, um, but they kept quiet. And then they funded uh, sort of uh, climate denial uh, groups for the last uh, 30 years. Um, and they've only just recently stopped because they got caught at it. Um, and um, yeah, so just thanks a lot for, for your, uh, your feedback today. And we'll, we'll see you next week, hopefully, uh, Kevin. It's been a pleasure again to come on and do the Extinction Report. Uh, I'd look forward to it coming back again next week. And a week is an incredibly long time in abrupt climate change. And sadly, I'm sure I'll have a lot more bad news for you next week. Well, thanks very, very much, Kevin. It's been fascinating. And uh, I think you've hit on all the, the major topics during the week. So I am looking forward to next week also. I'm in dairy, dairy, wondering where will I go next I'm on the road again, God knows I try to do my best I'm gonna fall in love with my friend that I know I may regret I've been busking many times, my needs have been the last But I'm gonna live, I've been betting high for what I believe Só dinheiro, você diz que